Good morning. We'll just uh, open up our time in prayer and uh, commit this time to the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, Lord, we're thankful for this time that we can be here, uh, Lord, around your word, and uh, it is an absolute privilege, uh, Lord, to be looking into your scriptures, Heavenly Father, and uh, uh, Lord, as we do this, Lord, help us to be uh, mindful of what we're reading, look at the context, and uh, see your uh, goodness and love uh, toward mankind. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So we're going to uh, continue again this morning. We're looking at the false doctrine of Calvinism. Uh, we're refuting uh, a book. I'll just grab the book. We're refuting this book here called The Five Points of Calvinism, uh, defined, defended, and documented uh, by David N. Steele, Curtis C. Thomas, and S. Lance Quinn. And, uh, this book is endorsed by people like John MacArthur, uh, but the book states the five points of Calvinism uh, in the book as T stands for total depravity or total inability, U stands for unconditional election, L stands for limited atonement, and I stands for irresistible grace or the efficacious call of the Spirit, and P stands for perseverance of the saints uh, or the security of believers. So we're about 13 lessons into the series now and we're up to uh, the L in the tulip which stands for limited atonement and uh, which is the L in the uh, a Calvinist acrostic of the tulip and uh, this is the third lesson on the L uh, in Calvinism's limited atonement and uh, we've been, getting, <coughs> been going through all the Bible verses uh, that this book here, The Five Points of Calvinism, uh, used to defend uh, their doctrine. And the three subheadings under limited atonement in the book are, number one, Jesus actually saves. And uh, we looked at all the verses there in that one. And the second one is Jesus fulfills the eternal covenant. That's the one we're going to be looking at today. And the third subheading <coughs> under limited atonement is how Jesus dies for all and yet for a particular people. So uh, we've looked at all those verses in the last uh, two lessons that they used to try and prove limited atonement, which sat under the first subheading, which was Jesus actually saves. And uh, Jesus actually saves, and uh, we can agree with that. Uh, we just don't agree with the Calvinist uh, definition of how Jesus actually saves. And uh, when Calvinists speak about limited atonement, they are referring to the atonement that Jesus Christ made for sin when he died on the cross. And uh, the Bible does teach very clearly uh, that Jesus Christ atoned for the sin of the world and intended the atonement for sin be made for every individual. That any individual can then believe in Christ and have the forgiveness of sin and receive the atonement that was made for them. However, Calvinists uh, don't believe that it was intended uh, for every man. It was only intended uh, for the elect. And uh, most Calvinists teach correctly, as they do uh, in this book here, that the atonement made by Jesus Christ on the cross was sufficient enough to atone for all sin. So it's sufficient enough to atone for all sin. However, even though sufficient enough to atone for all sin, Calvinists teach that the atonement was intended only to atone for the sin of those that God unconditionally elected to be saved before the foundation of the world and nobody else. So on page 39 of the book, under the heading Particular Redemption or Limited Atonement, we read these opening statements. Uh, which we read uh, last week, we'll read them again. Election itself saved no one. It only marked out particular sinners for salvation. Those chosen by the Father and given to the Son, and what they mean there is before the foundation of the world, as we've looked at, they had to be redeemed if they were to be saved. In order to secure their redemption, <coughs> that's the unconditionally elected ones before the foundation of the world, 
Jesus Christ came into the world and took upon himself human nature so that he might identify himself with his people. What they mean by that when they say his people, as we've looked at um, before, is the people that were chosen to be saved before the foundation of the world. So uh, he, that he might identify himself with his people and act as their legal representative or substitute. Through his substitutionary sacrifice, he endured the penalty for their sins and thus removed their guilt forever. Consequently, when his people are joined to him by faith, they are credited with perfect righteousness and are freed from all guilt and condemnation. Christ's redeeming work was definite in design and accomplishment that it was intended to render complete satisfaction for certain specified sinners and that it actually secures salvation for these individuals and for no one else. Redemption, therefore, was designed to bring to pass God's purpose of election. I'll say that one again. They say in this book that redemption, therefore, was designed to bring to pass God's purpose of election. So you can see there that according to this book, uh, the five points of Calvinism, the whole design of redemption, the whole reason, if you like, that Jesus came to suffer and die on the cross was to bring to pass God's purpose of election. Well, that's Calvinism's unconditional election of only certain elect individuals that were selected to be believers before the foundation of the world and nobody else. So we're now up to the second subheading under limited atonement in the book, uh, which is Jesus fulfills uh, the eternal covenant. So what do they mean? What do they mean by the eternal covenant? On page 45 of the book, under the subheading, Jesus fulfills the eternal covenant, <coughs> we read this statement. Scripture represents the Lord Jesus Christ and all that he did and suffered for his people. So remember when they're referring to his people, they mean people that were uh, selected to be saved before the foundation of the world. Whenever you see his people, that's what they mean. As fulfilling the terms of a gracious compact or arrangement which he had entered into with his heavenly Father before the foundation of the world. This is what they say. And uh, so the book goes on to say, Jesus was sent into the world by the Father to save the people whom the Father had given to him those given to him by the Father come to him, see and believe him, and none of them shall be lost. <coughs> so we see here uh, the Calvinist teaching that people were given by the Father to Jesus before uh, the foundation of the world. These are Calvinism's unconditionally uh, elected ones, as we've looked at in previous lessons. So the questions that we need to ask are these. These are the questions we need to ask. Was there an eternal covenant or an arrangement, as it says here in the book, where the Father was giving only certain individuals to the Son before the foundation of the world to be saved, to the exclusion of others? That's what we need to ask. Is the cross, there's another one we can ask, is the cross and what Jesus accomplished just a fulfilment of Calvinism's unconditional election? Is this what the Bible describes as the eternal covenant? As I said at the end of last week's lesson, uh, that the King James Bible doesn't use the phrase eternal covenant. Uh, however, it does use the term everlasting covenant. And uh, we see the phrase everlasting covenant mentioned 14 times in the King James Bible. And uh, the first time is in uh, Genesis chapter 9, where the Lord promises never to flood the earth again uh, with water. In this sense, it is called an everlasting covenant. You know, the Lord set uh, the token of the covenant with a rainbow uh, as a reminder of this everlasting covenant in this area. In Genesis 9:16, <coughs> we read, And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. Uh, so we can rule uh, that one out, that uh, the everlasting covenant here in this instance has nothing to do with uh, 
Calvinism and, and their explanation of it, uh, of their eternal covenant. So in Leviticus chapter 24, we see another everlasting covenant. We see it mentioned again, Le Leviticus 24, 7 to 9, and thou shalt put uh, frankincense upon each row, that is, it, uh, that it may be on the bread for a memorial, even an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Every Sabbath he shall set it in order before the Lord continually, being taken from the children of Israel by an everlasting covenant. And it shall be Aaron's and his sons, and they shall eat it in the holy place, for it is most holy unto him of the offerings of the Lord made by fire by a perpetual statute. <coughs> so we can um, rule this one out too. You know, the everlasting covenant here is to Israel and pertains to the things of the worship of the temple, in the temple, you know, with particular statutes that involve Aaron and his sons. So that has nothing to do with Calvinism or their explanation of uh, the eternal covenant that they mention as Jesus fulfilling, as described in the book, The Five Points of Calvinism. Uh, we see David mention the phrase everlasting covenant in 2 Samuel 23, 5. Although my house be not so with God, yet he hath made with me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things and sure, for this is all my salvation and all my desire, although he make it not to grow. So uh, this is no doubt what is known as the <coughs> Davidic covenant uh, from chapter 7, whereby the Lord promised David that out of his loins would come one who will build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever, uh, which is a definite double reference not only to Solomon uh, but to Jesus Christ, which I'm sure even most Calvinists would agree on that point. So we can rule that one out, you know. It doesn't say anything about a covenant whereby God was picking out some to be believers before the foundation of the world. So we see an everlasting covenant mentioned in 1 Chronicles 16, uh, 14 to 19. Uh, it says, he, he is the Lord, our God. His judgments are in all the earth. Be ye mindful always of his covenant. The word which he commanded to a thousand generations, even the covenant which he had which he made with Abraham and of his oath unto Isaac and hath confirmed the same to Jacob for a law and to Israel for an everlasting covenant, saying, Unto thee will I give the, give the land of Canaan the lot of your inheritance, when ye were but few, even a few and strangers in it. So we see here that to Israel uh, <coughs> was the land of Canaan promised uh, for an everlasting covenant. You know, that's all it says. And there's more that could be discussed around that for another time. Uh, but one thing for sure is it says nothing about a covenant whereby God the Father was picking out only Son to be saved and giving them to God the Son before the foundation of the world. It doesn't say anything about that. You know, this is a covenant made with people. You know, not a covenant between the Father and the Son, so it can't be the one that the book is describing. In Psalm 105, we see the phrase everlasting covenant mentioned again. And uh, this is almost word uh, for word from 1 Chronicles chapter 16. So again, referring to the everlasting covenant made to Israel regarding the land. Psalm 105, 9 to 11, we read, which covenant he made with Abraham and his oath unto Isaac and confirmed the same unto Jacob for a law and to Israel for an everlasting covenant, saying unto thee, will I give thee the land of Canaan a lot of your inheritance when they were but a few men in number, yea, very few and strangers in it. So that's, you know, uh, rule that one out. It's the same as 1 Chronicles. Uh, we see the phrase everlasting covenant in Isaiah 24, 5 to 6. The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, <coughs> broken, broken the everlasting covenant. So there we see an everlasting covenant can be broken. Therefore, uh, verse 6, Therefore hath the curse devoured the earth, 
and they that dwell therein are desolate. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned and few men left. So here we see judgment prophesied by the prophet Isaiah because most men have broken the everlasting covenant and only a few men left. So this can't be the Calvinist eternal covenant as described in the book, the five points of Calvinism, as the covenant described was made between God the Father and God the Son in the book. So remember the book said, as fulfilling the terms of a gracious compact or arrangement which he, Jesus Christ, entered into with his heavenly Father before the foundation of the world. That's not describing that. So we see the phrase, everlasting covenant mentioned again in Isaiah 55.3, We see it again in Isaiah 61.8, Jeremiah 32.40, Ezekiel 16.60, Ezekiel 37.26, and you can all look that up in your own time. But all these are prophecies to Israel upon their disobedience, whereby the Lord says, I will, I will make an everlasting covenant with them. And again, it is promises made of an intended everlasting covenant to people not a covenant made between God the Father and God the Son to save only some from before the foundation of the world. So we also see the phrase everlasting covenant in Genesis chapter 17, where we see it mentioned twice. And I believe this one is closely connected to the one and only time that we see the everlasting covenant mentioned in the New Testament. And we're going to look at Uh, the one in the New Testament in a a minute, but the the Lord says here to Abraham in Genesis chapter 17, so in Genesis chapter 17, 5 to 8, (coughs) we read, Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee, and I will make thee exceeding fruitful And I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee, and I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant, to be a God unto thee, and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee, and to thy seed after thee, the land wherein thou art a stranger, or the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I'll be their God. So then we see it mentioned again in verse 19 of the same chapter, Genesis 17, 19. <coughs> and God said, Sarah, thy wife, shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac, and I'll establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. So here we see an everlasting covenant <coughs> that was made between God, Abraham, and his seed after him. I believe the covenant here made with Abraham and his seed leads to the promised seed itself, which is Christ. Uh, All the promises made to Israel have their fulfilment in Jesus Christ. In Galatians 3, 16 to 17, we read this, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made, and he saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And this I say that the covenant which was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul, that it should make the promise of none effect. And uh, what is this promise? What is the promise? Is the promise that was given to Abraham and confirmed before in Christ that God would save only some selected individuals before the foundation of the world? selected to be believers, to the the neglect of others? Is that what the promise is about? Does the Bible ever say that? No. Galatians 3, 22, the same chapter, tells us what the promise is about. It says, Galatians 3, 22, but the scripture hath concluded all under sin. See, everyone has sinned. So all are under sin. That the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. That's what the promises are about. That's what the everlasting covenant is about that was given to Abraham and his seed. In Genesis chapter 9, when Abraham in obedience to God took Isaac, his only begotten son, up to the mountain in faith, knew that somehow God would provide himself a lamb. 
And he even tells Isaac this on his way up to the mountain. And then when he reaches out to take the knife to slay his son, God stops him from doing it. And then in verse 16, uh, uh, the Lord says to Abraham in Genesis 9, 16, uh, Genesis 9, 16 to 18, and the Lord said, and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of, heavens, of, of heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in thy seed... And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth, earth be blessed, because thou hast, hast obeyed my voice. And we read in Hebrews 11 that Abraham was convinced that even if he slayed his son Isaac, that God would raise him up again. That's how much Abraham believed the promises of God. So then we have the New Testament in which we see the last and only time the everlasting covenant is mentioned in the new and this is in the new testament <coughs> and uh, this could be the verse that the book here the five points of calvinism are referring to with their subheading uh the subheading of jesus fulfills the eternal covenant it could be they don't actually uh reference uh, uh scripture verse for that um, so it could be this um, you know, they don't reference this verse, however, they do use the ESV version of the Bible in the book. And uh, this is the only place in the ESV where the phrase eternal covenant is mentioned. You know, the King James Bible says everlasting covenant. Uh, the only time you read the, the term eternal covenant is in the ESV, and that's in this verse here in Hebrews. So I'm guessing this is the one they're referring to. Hebrews 13, 20 to 21 in our Bible says, Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, or eternal covenant, as it says in the ESV, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever Amen. So we see here <coughs> that the blood of the everlasting covenant here in this instance has everything to do with Jesus Christ and what he accomplished through his death on the cross and also his resurrection from the dead. So we need to ask the question, what did Jesus accomplish according to the blood of the everlasting covenant when compared with all of Scripture? What is, was it a covenant where God promised to save only certain individuals before the foundation of the world? Giving only them to Jesus to the exclusion of others before the foundation of the world? Because you can't see that here in this passage in Hebrews. Actually, you can't see that anywhere in the Bible, let alone here in Hebrews or anywhere in the Bible where it mentions the everlasting covenant. You can't find it. See, the blood of the everlasting covenant through Jesus Christ accomplished atonement for the sin of the whole world. That all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Jesus paid it all for sin. That's atonement accomplished. And the scripture has concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believed. Uh, that believe. That's atonement applied. So when we look at this subheading in the book, Jesus fulfills the eternal covenant that sits under their main heading of a limited atonement. Given all that we have looked at in the Bible regarding the everlasting covenant, is their description of the eternal covenant or everlasting covenant, covenant even biblical? It's not. I'll read it again. The statement under the subheading, Jesus fulfills the eternal covenant, quote, Scripture represents the Lord Jesus Christ and all that he did and suffered for his people. Remember, that's unconditionally elected people before the foundation of the world as fulfilling the terms of a gracious compact 
or arrangement which he had entered into with his heavenly Father before the foundation of the world. Jesus was sent into the world by the Father to save the people whom the Father had given to him. Those given to him by the Father come to him, see and believe in him, and none of them shall be lost. <coughs> well, we can't see that description of the everlasting covenant anywhere in the Bible. It's just not there. That's not how the Bible describes the everlasting covenant. So where do they get this from? Where do they get it? Well, I believe it's from their wrong interpretation of passages like Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, which we looked at last week. From their wrong interpretations of Romans chapter 9, which we've looked at in previous lesson. But also uh, here in the book where it takes us to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. See, when you build a doctrine in, in your head from a wrong interpretation of Scripture, such as you know, Ephesians chapter 1 or Romans chapter 9, then what happens is when you read other Scriptures and you've created this template, then everything that you read gets filtered through this template. You end up putting this template over the Bible and you start reading everything through the, through the template that you create. See, and then uh, what ends up happening is context is ignored, other scriptures that appear to point blank contradict even the, uh, uh, the things that you're saying uh, get, just become a tension and then you start saying there's tension in the Bible where there is no tension and uh, you start coming up with two contradictory wills of God you know that you can't reconcile things like thou shalt not but then God predetermines you to do those very things that thou shalt not this is the kind of knots and the big ball of mess that Calvinism uh, does to people. So the book now takes us to John chapter 6, uh, verse 35 to 40. So if you want to turn there in your Bibles, because uh, we're going to look at context uh, here and looking at other verses as well. And uh, so this is, uh, you know, Jesus fulfills the eternal covenant. You know, they're taking us to John chapter 6. You know, so... Let's look at this. John chapter 6, verse 35 to 40. We'll read this. <coughs> and Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. <coughs> but I said unto you that ye also have seen me and believe not. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life and I'll raise him up at the last day. So the book uh, here focuses on the words there in verse 37 uh, where in the book they put uh, this in italics you know so you can focus on these words and it's in there in verse 37 which says uh, all that the Father giveth me shall come to me. So we see it there again in verse 39 where it says, and this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. So the Calvinist here gets out their template, you see, and they put it uh, over the Bible and they impose on the text that there must be, that these ones that are given by the Father to the Son must be the unconditionally elected ones that were given by the Father to Jesus before the foundation of the world even though you can't find that anywhere in the text. So the questions that need to be asked regarding this passage are these. When were they given by the Father to Jesus? When? And why? Why were these ones given to the Father uh, by the Father to Jesus? So the context here is Jews who believe and boast that they are following the Father and yet are rejecting the Son. That's the context. So they are not true 
followers of the Father, and Jesus knows it. See, a true follower of the Father would not reject the Son. So if we go back to uh, just one chapter, Jesus says to them in chapter 5, uh, we'll look at verse 37, and Jesus says, And the Father himself which hath sent me hath borne witness of me, ye have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his shape. And ye have not his word abiding in you, for whom he hath sent, him ye believe not. Look at this, verse 39, search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are which testify of me. And ye will not come to me, that ye might have life. So you can see here that if they had truly followed the Father and what he had said in the scriptures concerning the Son, then they would have come straight to Jesus. People like Peter, people like Simeon, people like Nathaniel, even John the Apostle here, they don't need any convincing that this was the Messiah. They were true followers of God the Father. See, in chapter 6, the multitude of Jews then followed Jesus over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee and then he uh, fed them, uh, all being about 5,000 uh, men, it says there, uh, probably women and children as well, but they were following Jesus for the wrong reasons. Then they followed him to Capernaum and look what Jesus says to them in verse 26 uh, of John chapter 6. Um, we'll look at verse 27. And uh, well, verse 26, Jesus, actually, verse 26, Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, you seek me not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. <coughs> and then uh, Jesus said, says in verse 27, Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for the meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man, look at this, shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. Verse 28, Then they said unto him, What shall we do, that we might work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he has sent. See, the problem wasn't that they were not part of Calvinism's unconditionally elect. That wasn't the problem. You know, that wasn't the reason they couldn't come to Jesus. You can't get that or assume that here in this passage unless you place Calvin's template over the Bible. The reason was because they laboured for the wrong meat. They laboured for the meat that perishes. And then Jesus tells them something they can do. And that is to labour for the meat which endureth unto eternal life, which the Son of Man shall give you. Then he says to them that this is the work of God, that you believe on him who is sent. That would be a dishonest thing to say to them if Calvinism is true. And they were not part of Calvinism's unconditionally elected from before the foundation of the world. How could you say that to them? Asking people to believe who haven't been selected to be believers. So even Calvinism's template just, it just, just destroys this scripture. It's terrible what they do to it. Verse 30, They said therefore unto him, What sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? What thou doest, uh, what, what dost thou work? Sorry. Our fathers did eat manna in the desert. <coughs> As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said unto, him, said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. So my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. So that statement there from Jesus goes directly against Calvinism's limited atonement. In Calvinism, the true bread from heaven is only intended for the unconditionally elected. But here Jesus says, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. Yes, even these ones that claim to know the Father but don't. Because they refuse to listen and learn of the Father. 
But verse 33, for the bread, for the, Jesus says, for the bread of God <clears throat> is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the unconditional elect. No, it says he gives life unto the world. See, that's atonement accomplished. That's atonement accomplished. 2 Corinthians 5 says God was, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. Verse 34 says, Then Jesus said they, <coughs> sorry, then said they unto him, unto Jesus, Lord, evermore, give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. See, that's not an empty invitation either to these people. That's not an empty invitation. Jesus means that. He means what he says. See, it's not just an invitation to Calvinism's unconditionally elect. Verse 36, but I, but, but I said unto you that ye also have seen me <coughs> and believe not. So why haven't they believed? That's what you need to ask. Because for the Calvinists, they are teaching in this passage that the reason they don't believe is, is because they were not selected to be a believer from before the foundation of the world. So we've already looked at the reason and it's because they don't have the love of God in them. That's what Jesus said to them in chapter 5. They are not true followers of the Father. See, because Jesus and the Father are one. And look what Jesus says to them in verse 37. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. So in the context of the passage here, who are the people that are given by the Father to Jesus? Because it's not Calvinism's unconditionally elect from before the foundation of the world as they would try to have you to believe. It is those that have been true worshippers of God the Father under the old covenant, those that have listened and learned of the Father, those that have searched the scriptures and were ready for the coming Messiah, those that were of the faith of Abraham, those that understood in part and believed all these things, these were the ones given by the Father to the Son. That's the context of the passage. If you look over at verse 45 of the same chapter, Jesus spells it out very plainly. John 6, 45, As it is written in the prophets, and they shall, all, they shall be all taught of God, every man therefore that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. Now we have the uh, New Testament written for us now and we have a lot more revelation than the Old Testament saints had. The Old Testament saints came to Jesus through the Father. We come to the Father through Jesus. In John 14, 5 to 11 we read, Thomas Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And yet Jesus was telling the Jews back in chapter 6 that if they had truly come to the Father, then they would have had come to Jesus. Verse 7, look at what he says. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. Look at this. And from henceforth you know him and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth, sufficeth or be sufficient for us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? And he that hath seen me hath seen the Father, and how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believest, believest not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. 
So when we take the context of John chapter 6 with the context of the whole Gospel of John, we can, con we can conclude that Jesus was not out to show Calvinism's limited atonement, but that he was showing unbelieving Jews his oneness and equality with God the Father, and that to believe in the Father, you must believe in the Son. And if you believe in the Son, then you are a true follower of the Father. And this is an open invitation to all, even to those ones that were rejecting him at the time. So next lesson, uh, we're going to look at the rest of the verses and passages that the book uses under the subheading, uh, Jesus fulfills the eternal covenant, uh, which sits under the main heading of limited atonement in the, in the book we are refuting. You know, they go to uh, chapters uh, like uh, John chapter uh, 11, you know, where uh, Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. Well, we're going to ask the question, who's sheep? Who are the sheep? <laughs> Things like this. And, uh, but we'll look at that next time. Let's pray.